I want to say thank you again for joining us today. My name is Ian Thomas Tafoya, and I am the Colorado Field Advocate for Green Latinos. And I am very happy to be here today with so many of my great friends and some new friends um, whom are coming to help us and bring awareness about the issues that are facing us in one of the most polluted zip codes in America. So you'll see here we have Green Latinos, Moms Clean Air Force, the Environmental Justice Leadership Forum and Earth Justice. And we are so excited um, to have Renee Chacon from Spirit of the Sun, who's gonna be closing it out for us. So I'm gonna to go to the next slide. We wanna start out by acknowledging the land in which we reside on. We know that the Cheyenne and Arapaho and the Ute lived here in Denver and in Northern um, Colorado. But we do wanna just uh, point out that there are many, many tribes because we were the headwater state that did call this place home. The Pueblo, the Navajo, the Hopi, the Apache, the Kiowa, the Comanche, the Shoshone, they all ranged in this land. They all were water protectors. They all fought for the next seven generations. And it is through this uh, lens that we are going to be examining the environmental racism that has been going on since the destruction um, of these tribal nations um, in that period of time and where we are at today with black, brown and indigenous people whom are fighting back against environmental racism. So today you are going to hear from me with Green Latinos, Lucy Molina, who is a community organizer and concerned mom uh, who lives near uh, the Suncor refinery in Commerce City. Rebecca Curry from Earth Justice, the Colorado policy advocate. Shana Oliver from Moms Clean Air Force Colorado and a field organizer. Um, Kareen Taylor from Environmental Justice Leadership Forum. Um, and that's, you're gonna hear a lot about this organization and how this organization can be a partner to the work that we're doing here in North Denver. And as I said, my great friend, Renee Millard Chacon, who is going to be talking to us and closing this whole conversation for us. So with that, Lucy, we're gonna go straight to you to talk about what we're doing and why we're here. Hola, can you hear me? All right. Uh, remember y'all, I live in Commerce City, so I always say that even my internet's polluted. So sometimes I tend to like just freeze. So, um, well, uh, buenas tardes. Um, yo me llamo Lucy Molina. My name is Lucy Molina and I wanna thank uh, Ian and all, um, all of you for inviting me and giving me this space. And I also wanna thank God, of course, thanks to God Elohim for this um, opportunity to speak concerning uh, the issues that we're fighting, uh, that we're dealing with here in Commerce City. So just like Ian mentioned, I mean, uh, really I, a lot of people already have heard um, a little bit about my story, uh, dealing with a lot of uh, medical issues. Uh, some people do know me from, I got to run for my life last year. That's me. I, uh, I ran for office last year. I never, I'm just a mom, okay? I'm, I'm not an expert. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a lawyer. I, I'm just a single mom that had two children that were sick and a grandmother that just passed away from leukemia. Uh, I'm still dealing with cancer right now with uh, family and uh, you know, uh, it, it was getting kind of frustrating uh, seeing the issues that this community has been facing. Now, I live, yes, next to the oil refinery here, Suncor, which we know has been emitting 800 tons of cyanide into our community. I mean, and this is something that we just found out. Imagine like times, uh, what, since 1931, all that has been coming into our water, our air, and our soil. So that's why I call Commerce City an environmental vomit. Uh, we have Suncor in the south. We have up to 300 and, or 500 wells coming up in the north. And we have the arsenal here in the, in the center where it's, I mean, our children, uh, our children's high school is actually sitting on contaminated land. Um, to me, yes, like Ian said, it is environmental racism, okay? Uh, most recently, um, the state fined Suncor $9 million. Uh, if this is not the epitome of environmental racism, I don't know what is, okay? When, when the state finds the Suncor or the culprit that is killing us here $9 million and gives them back $6 million, I mean, what the fuck is that? I don't see that as justice, okay? Uh, I, I'm very, very disappointed with the CDPHE and the way they're, uh, 
Yo, we say in Spanish, nos están mirando la cara. Nos están mirando la cara de pendejos. The, the, they're looking at us like we fools. Like we don't understand what's going on and we don't understand the law. Okay, so then, yes, educate to regulate, which is why I got involved as a mother. I was facing privatization of education in my community here in Adams 14, where we are the lowest performing district in the state. Okay, if that is not a sore thumb, I don't know what is, okay? When we have kids that we have the, the highest asthma rates here in Commerce City, we have cancer, we have children that are taking care of their dying parents and sick parents that uh, actually end up leaving school just so they could pick up two or three jobs at 7-Eleven. You know what I mean? Um, that, is the, that is environmental racism, ec economic racism, and edu educational racism. That is what we face here in Commerce City, okay? Um, I am uh, very passionate for, of what I'm doing right now because it concerns the future of my children, you know, your, your children. Uh, I do ask uh, all my, uh, you know, elected officials and community leaders like Ian, you know, I really appreciate your work, Shayna and Renee, that since even March, we've been trying to bring these uh, community uh, information to, the, to, to all of you guys. Uh, I wanna thank you guys. Um, and I wanna, you know, call you guys to just please uh, remember us. <laughs> Don't leave us behind. I mean, you know, I always say there's, there's, a, there's a difference between a public servant and a politician, okay? A public servant, usually grows with their community. That is, you know, you serve the public, public servant, okay? You don't leave your community behind. A, po a politician is there for their own glory, power, or special interest. And they usually end up leaving four or eight years later and they're millionaires, uh, you know, usually by oil and gas, right? And then they come back to our poor little communities trying to, you know, bring the solutions when they created the problems, you know? That is environmental racism. You know, there's a lot, a lot of injustice that we face. I can, you know, go on and on. I also get to help because I, like I always say, where the problem is, there's where the, that's where the solution lies. We are a big problem here in the state with these polluters that we have, you know, we have PFAS in our water. We have no drinking water, you guys. How many years? That is not normal. We have no drinking water here in Commerce City. Um, I mean, I have to buy water all the time just to cook. Um, it is un uncomfortable. Each summer is getting hotter. Um, so there is a lot of injustice and exploitation because when they say that the tax... Lucy, you cut out. Yeah. Lucy, wait. Like we lost Lucy. Sorry. Yeah. Start a taxi. Did it well, freeze her? Yeah, it froze. Yeah. We could. Yeah. Eat. See, I told you guys, I warned y'all. Even my internet is polluted. So, yeah. anyway, yeah, I'll, I'll probably here cut it off because I can go on and on. So, then uh, with that, I would like to say I'm also helping with PSR Colorado because uh, as a mother, I trust my doctors, uh, physicians for social responsibility here in Colorado. Um, and that's bringing, you know, solutions like healthy electric homes, also environmental justice. I invite you guys December 5th uh, to the medical symposium that we will be having, which is how I actually found out that I was getting, uh, that perhaps this refinery is the cause of all the medical issues that my family has been facing. So, which is why I am involved. Um, I thank Ian and all of you for the space. Um, Muchas gracias. And I tell you guys, you know, my call to action is yes. Testify wherever you can. City council, uh, you know, your school board, uh, commissioners, state, wherever you can, AQCC, COGCC. I didn't know none of these things, you guys. Inclusion matters, okay? I always say I was not invited. I crashed the party, okay? Because I was never invited. That's how I met Shayna. You know, th this is how I met a lot of my indigenous community was because we accidentally bumped e into each other at an AQCC meeting. And, you know, it was sad to see that we were the most impacted communities and the least represented, okay? So 
again, yes, let's step it up. Let's educate to regulate. Let's continue these type of platform platforms and let's support uh, leaders and community members and elected officials that that uh, that protect our planet and our families. Okay. Uh, muchas gracias. Dios los bendiga. And again, thank you so much for this opportunity to speak. Thank you for that, Lucy. Uh, my name is Corrine Taylor. I'm Director of Federal Legislative Affairs for WE Act for Environmental Justice. WE Act, um, keep, keep, go back one slide, thanks. WE Act um, is an environmental justice organization that was founded and based in Harlem in Northern Manhattan. Uh, but we also are the coordinator of the Environmental Justice Leadership Forum, which is a coalition of about 60 organizations in 24 states. Our coalition works together to advance climate justice and impact policy to ensure that people like everyone here, including Lucy, Becca, Shana, Renee, Ian, are a part of the policy creation process at the federal level. We also provide technical assistance and um, even help with capacity for smaller environmental justice organizations to help them do their own state work um, to advance climate justice, environmental health uh, policies there at the local level, even energy um, justice uh, policies as well. And so today we're really just sharing our platform with, the, with these really important leaders in Colorado and Commerce and Denver to just shine a light on what's happening there for them locally and then connect it to the things that are happening federally and how we can utilize um, federal legislation to help remediate, to um, address these legacy pollutions that are existing not only in Colorado, but in countries all throughout the country. We're having um, this conversation today and we'll also be having another conversation with environmental justice leaders in Detroit on um, on Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern. So there's another opportunity to hear about how environmental justice issues are impacting the entire the entire country. And so my role today is to turn it over to, to these folks here. A part of the Hamez principles and democratic organizing is to have the people speak for themselves. And everyone that we see here represented knows for themselves by their firsthand experience what's going on in Denver, what's going on in Commerce City, what's going on in Colorado. So I turn it back over to you guys and thank you so much for sharing your, your expertise, your experience with us today. Okay, technical difficulty. Let's see if we can go to the next slide. These are your slides, Shana. Hi. So um, my name is Shana Oliver. I am a field organizer with Moms Clean Air Force for Colorado chapter. And I also speak on advocating for, indig for indigenous people's rights, our right to clean air, water, and lands, as well as um, um, bringing my voice to, to the table, as well as bringing it to these public hearings on local um, government issues. Um, but Moms Clean Air Force organization is a national organization with um, over 1 million moms, dads, and caregivers um, across all 50 states. And here uh, in Colorado, we have over 43,000 members and we're all united in fighting for our children's health as well as um, fighting against the climate um, change pollution in our air. And just as this slide um, shows that air pollution and COVID-19 have really close relationships right now. And it's showing the disproportionate impact on particularly um, people of color, um, people of color um, communities, as well as Im immigrant um, communities. We're, we are the most impacted with this COVID-19 because of the air pollution that we live in, in our environment, in our communities. And um, that has been really detrimental to our people during this time. And then next slide. Mm. And it's just very unfortunate that like on the, even you see on the Navajo reservation that um, we're very heavily impacted with this res respiratory um, sickness. But um, so we go back to communities so black communities and air pollution is really detrimental to our children. And 
about 11.6% of black children have asthma compared to um, um, white counterpart um, children who only have 8.3%. And not only that, they, ha they have to deal with the short lifespan of, of, um, of likely to die three times more from air pollution than um, white counterparts and climate change. Um, they contribute the less, the least amount to climate change, but are going to bear 20% more of the harms than um, other racial groups, as well as um, Latino communities are also um, disproportionately impacted with air pollution. As you see here in this community of zip code 80216, and as well as it's the surrounding area. Um, Latinos are three times more likely to be affected by air pollution because they, um, where they live and work and the conditions under that. So 68% of Latinos live in areas that do not meet federal air quality standards compared to 58% of um, whites. So 1.81 million Latinos live within a half mile of oil and gas facilities. And we see that's very true in our communities that um, given the numbers of like Commerce City and Adams County, um, especially North Adams County area. Um, next slide. And indigenous people, uh, we, we have a long history of living or having to deal with polluting industries such as the coal plants, um, uranium uh, mines, and as well as oil and gas drilling. Um, these things have been um, enforced on our, on our land to, as well as our communities. So we, we have a high, high, higher risks of adverse birth outcomes and asthma, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, cancers, premature deaths than, than the majority of the general population. So environmental cleanup in the US, in US tribal communities is significantly behind that of non-tribal communities. So it, it's literally, um, they either come and take responsibility and do cleanup or they just ignore um, the cleanup for a while by stalling on for regulations that um, end up getting passed that allow um, these industries to pollute on indigenous lands. So um, not only that, we have to we have to really look to the policies of why these things are happening, and that's why it's important um, as a mom to speak up on policy change because that's where um, these lawmakers not only lawmakers, but law buyers, such as our commissioners, our mayors, our governors, um, the EPA, um, the Congress, senators, they all fall on these policies that they let be barriers from um, doing the right thing. So that's where we need to work on voicing our, our voice as community members that these policies must change for the health and health and safety of our children because developing lungs, newborns, they're the most impacted with air pollution, especially um, ground level ozone smog. And I think when I joined with Moms Clean Air Force, um, it wasn't until later I started public speaking. And why I joined Moms Clean Air Force, because I figured they would understand um, a mom's schedule. It is very hard for us as mothers, um, parents to take part in these public um, spaces as well as being a part of these um, engagements at the um, at public hearings and being able to take that time and be present. That's what's really um, where we need to work as communities that if we can at least engage by either writing and voicing these burdens to our um, policymakers, as well as these industries that are entities, government entities that are supposed to be taking care of our health and safety, along with our environment, and as well as they're supposed to ensure that we have economic sus sustainability. And that's why we need to be more vocal on what's happening in our communities, because um, these these industries don't, or these entities don't 
understand where we live, what we're breathing. And when we voice together um, our own individual personal stories, not stories, but our testimonies, they have a different, um, this, it's, it's different for them to hear people's personal stories versus the lobbyists that are lobbying for, the, for these companies to continue to pollute in our community. So that's why it's important for us as community members to, to voice um, our story, um, voice that we want change in our air quality. Because Colorado, we have like the 10th, um, we're the 10th state to have the worst air quality to breathe. And we have over 400 um, people in the state that have asthma, as well as um, there's people that are um, going under cancer treatment because they live in these communities, such as um, Lucy Molina, who has to take care of her family every time um, she has to go take them to go treat for radiation and all that. So those things are a burden in our communities. And that's why it's important when, that they hear our stories and that it comes from us um, and not the industry. And that's, um, that's why I got involved with Moms Clean Air Force is to voice my story. And not only that, they were really helpful in, um, in crafting my story to be, to be more, um, to be more um, demanding of, of these people of leadership to, who make decisions on our community. So I think it's really um, a great group to be a part of and where, especially like, all these groups are very um, encouraging to be with. And it's really about what you feel comfortable doing and tipping your toes in the water is like um, signing the petition online. That's honestly where I started is signing petitions online is what made it really useful as well as being able to write an email from my phone, um, as well as making um, those phone calls to these legislators to make change on what's going on or to, um, for them to think before pushing a, an agenda on communities um, that are def detrimental to communities down the river as well as detrimental to the community's air quality. Um, I think we can go to the next slide. Gina, I think that's it for the slides we had All for right. you. All right. Thank, thank you, so you everybody. <clears throat> so uh, thank you again for everyone who's joining us. We're about to give you an, a real quick overview of some of the air, water, and soil pollution concerns here in North Denver. I want to make clear, there's probably more than we could do in this one presentation. There are train yards, and as you can see in this map, other bodies of water that we are not going to be talking about today. We've already been discussing whether we're going to do a part two to really try to pull this back, but I want to start by inviting my friend uh, Becca Curry on, whom I've worked side by side with Earth Justice in a fight for this community for maybe five or six years now, and it, I can really say that Earth Justice, when you need an attorney, you when you're going to get in trouble, you need an attorney. When you get in trouble as a community, or justice is there for you. So Becca, we have you on the line? Yeah, I'm here. All right, Becca. So yeah, so, yeah, as Ian said, just a, this is a um, quick overview of just some um, highlights of, um, so, of types of pollution and sources of pollution in North Denver. Um, like Shana was talking about um, and Lucy, Communities in North Denver have for decades, you know, suffered a disproportionate share of the city's environmental, social and economic impacts, particularly, you know, we're looking in at 80216 um, has been listed as the riskiest in the country for environmental hazard risks, um, judged by a number of factors. Um, next slide. And so looking at like what types of pollution that we're 
um, seeing in North Denver, uh, first talking about ozone, which also Shana kind of alluded to, and as well as ozone precursors. So uh, chemical compounds that uh, break down in the atmosphere and become ozone. Um, it's a reactive gas. We know it as smog or haze. Um, and there's many sources that are there present in the North Timber community, and as well as fracking operations that release significant amounts of methane, which is a, um, both a VOC, a volatile organic compound, and potent greenhouse gas. Um, uh, ozone itself is linked to premature death, shortness, shortness of breath, asthma attacks, and a number of other um, health impacts. Um, the American Lung Association State of the Air report gave Denver an F grade, um, for ozone pollution, and it ranked um, in the top 10 cities nationwide with the worst ozone pollution. And just in January of this year, the EPA announced um, that the Denver Metro North Front Range area was going to be reclassified from moderate to serious non-attainment under the Clean Air Act. And actually that has a, that's essentially that we haven't adhered to some goals in reducing and keeping our ozone levels low. Um, and with this serious status, there's a deadline next year that if we don't meet certain targets, um, we will be downgraded to severe. And it, it's seeming likely that that is going to be happen and happening. Um, next slide. So also particulate pollution is a big one in North Denver communities. We're talking about um, tiny solids or solid or liquid droplets, droplets that are um, inhaled, thinking dust, dirt, soot, smoke. There's also natural um, particulate pollution like pollen, um, but you know, really the harmful ones are the ones that are coming from industry, from combustion, construction, um, activities which are common in the North Denver area. Studies link particular pollution to a wide variety of problems, kind of have them listed on the slide here. Um, and the American Lung Association State of the Air a report gave a C grade based on um, data from 2016 to 2018. We also have uh, high amounts of air toxics and hazardous air pollutants in North Denver, um, ones that are really known to cause serious health effects. The EPA actually re recognizes 187 different chemicals as toxic or hazardous. Um, and you know they pose different health risks depending on the pollutant, but I've listed a couple here that um, we know to be emitted in North Denver communities. Benzene being um, a big one because it's a known carcinogen that causes leukemia, has some very um, severe effects. Hydrogen cyanide, which is actually classified as a chemical warfare agent. Um, it was used in the Holocaust gas chambers. Um, and hydrogen sulfide, Suncor, for example, emits um, all three of these uh, pollutants into the surrounding community. Uh, next slide. Um, talking about air monitoring air quality in Colorado, um, the, this map here, these green dots are where CDPG has air monitors. And so, you know, it's pretty, they're there, but they're pretty sparse. And if you look at what uh, pollutants these monitors are looking at, it's really just um, nitrogen oxides, ozone, um, and carbon dioxide as um, a vol volatile organic compound and particulate matter of kind of two different sizes. Uh, it really isn't, these monitors really aren't measuring for anything outside of, outside of that. This is just an indicator of kind of air quality. And so we're really just looking at ozone, um, kind of two common precursors and particulates. Um, really no um, ongoing monitoring of um, air toxics, for example, of which there's very many that are emitted in the area. The mobile air monitoring laboratory that CPHE has, and they, they plan to add additional laboratory, mobile laboratories to their fleet, but um, we're not there yet. They are, it is capable of measuring some concentrations of air toxins like benzene, but again, this, this laboratory is actually a little bit more intended for use at oil and gas production sites, and so um, it's not necessarily prioritized for um, communities, and um, I, I know that they plan to do some of the North Denver communities, but uh, it's, you know, clearly the point I'm making here is that monitoring is, is extremely limited. Um, it's not in real time. Often what's reported out is just averages over a period of time, and so given that, um, it's really largely left up to facilities to self-police and to self-monitor um, which creates a big problem, as you can imagine. 
Um, next slide. Types of water pollution in North Denver, a big one um, that I'm gonna highlight here is PFAS, just cause it's been uh, kind of in the news a lot lately. These are man-made forever chemicals. They're really long ch chains of carbon synthetic that just don't break down. Um, they're really commonly used. You can find them in pizza boxes, your nonstick pans, uh, carpets, textiles, um, and there's over 6,000 different um, types of PFAS that are out there in the environment. And we're only beginning to just kind of learn about them and hone in on regulating a couple of them. Um, they are bioaccumulative, meaning they'll accumulate in your body and they're toxic at even extremely low concentrations, can lead to cancer, um, hormone and reproductive issues, immune system harm. Um, it, I, I just saw a question come through that I'm just gonna answer. Uh, it, it, that like smoke from wildfires would kind of fall into that particulate category and sometimes those toxic categories because we know that co commonly what's used to kind of put out fires is um, fertilizers and things like that. So, but um, often what you, what's taken into consideration with wildfires and air quality, it, it kind of falls into that particulate soot category. Um, and so, you know, it's carbon that's coming out. And so these are, you know, it's driving, it's a greenhouse gas. Um, it can react in the environment to form ozone in many cases. So um, yeah, it's, that's definitely a, a factor, um, just not explicitly called out in the, this presentation for sure. Um, PFAS have um, been discovered across the Denver metro area, Buckley Air Force Base along Sand Creek and at the Suncor Refinery. Um, in the summer of 2020, actually Colorado passed its first crack at regulating PFAS, which are just really narrative standards for um, surfacing, for, for just surface and groundwater. So we're not even at the point of regulating drinking water yet. And uh, we were happy to see Colorado taking action to regulate PFAS, but um, something that was disappointing is that they kind of followed the lead of an outdated EPA health advisory, which found um, a safe level of PFAS to be 70 parts per trillion. And so that's the level that Denver set for a couple of PFAS combined where we've seen other states that are really heating the research at much lower levels, closer to um, 11 or 12 parts per trillion for all PFAS com combined. So um, that's, that's PFAS, next slide. Um, just kind of a, a bunch of other types of water pollution that we see in North Denver, uh, you know, microbes, bacteria, salts, metals, pesticides, herbicides. Um, we are a, a little bit downstream from a lot of farming operations here, compounds, radioactive contaminants, um, widespread industrial, domestic, agricultural, medical, mining, firefighting, and technological uses have led to widespread distribution of um, water pollutants in the environment and in, in our streams and rivers and water sources. Um, a couple of examples um, here picked some that are have been in the news lately, but aren't necessarily ones that are regularly kind of monitored for lead. Um, it is one that's monitored for, but largely just because Denver Water likes to say that they don't have any lead leaving their facilities. Um, it gets into the water as it moves through water service lines and um, and household uh, kind of pipes that contain lead, which is often in older homes, causing serious health impacts, particularly in children, um, very serious impacts. Denver currently has a lead reduction program where they're trying to work um, to reduce lead piping throughout the city. Um, and at this point, at this stage, they should have reached out to consumers who they suspect have lead um, Pipes, yes, yes, and you know, our schools, it's not just homes that really need to be um, up, updating infrastructures uh, because lead pipes are, and it's true, Denver Water tests their water and they say that there's no lead, um, but then a lot of people are receiving water um, just because it's traveled through a system that has, has lead in it. Um, uh, Molybdenum is discharged by one of Colorado's largest mining operations. This is a metal, um, it's upstream. And, you know, there's been recent kind of controversy of whether, whether to um, 
set a level and the mine wants to raise the levels. Um, right now it's not even really a regulated contaminant, but it does have um, health impacts. Benzene is, you know, it's, it can be an air toxin. It can also be a water toxin. It's discharged from industrial processes. And recently Suncor has been kind of um, dinged as having uh, benzene emissions into the South Platte. Um, although it was found that it wasn't over, um, you know, levels that, that raised alarm, supposedly. Uh, next slide. Becca, I just want to add for a second here <clears throat> yeah. that I had a conversation with the South Platte uh, River Keepers who have been taking a look at really guarding over this part of the South Platte. And there are more than 200 stormwater outfall permits that pour into this section of the river alone. So each one of those, you can imagine just for the listeners, how much there is and how much scope there is for people like Becca and I to be able to review said permits, to put in um, opinions about them. So there's a lot going on and we really get to a place where even the resources for the state aren't really capable of analyzing every permit to make sure the efficacy and the safety is there in the way that we would hope. And so we've had conversations where they say, well, we're gonna try to pick like the 10 most uh, egregious ones, but what happens to the rest? This is all pollution that's adding up. And you know we have these goals, and particularly in Denver, about having waterways that are clean enough for us to play in. We're a long ways from that when we have stormwater outfalls that are pouring in all the pollution from our community. So kind of um, similar to with monitoring for air quality, there are big problems with monitoring water quality, um, mainly in that it's largely up to suppliers to monitor for contaminants in water. So. Um, relevant to this area, it's Denver water. Uh, sampling often occurs on a monthly basis. So, um, you know, we don't, aren't always catching when there might be a big rain washing off um, a lot of pesticides from an agri agricultural production or something like that. It's sometimes it's just periodic monitoring that doesn't really give us the full picture of what is going into our waters. And of course, um, I saw Bridget added in the chat, um, it's limited to just certain contaminants, really, they're monitoring for what, what's actually regulated, where um, we know that there are far more pollutants that aren't necessarily regulated or that we don't have limits set for. Um, PFAS is a great example of that because it's a chemical, chemical example of a chemical that we didn't even really know existed until um, a little over a decade ago, it was starting to really generate steam. Um, at Denver Water, you know, they annually they release a water quality report. Uh, in 2020, they kind of did their analysis and said that it's the water is safe and it meets or goes beyond requirements set by the EPA and state health department. Um, but for ex just as one example, an independent group, um, environmental work group found um, 10 con contaminants that exceed health guidelines that are actually more protective of human health, um, kind of heeding more recent research than um, the EPA including arsenic, radium, and chloroform, which can all cause cancer, um, were all present at, at uh, unsafe levels by more protective limits in our Denver water system. Next slide. So this is kind of, you're getting a sense of this, right? Legal does not equal safe. Um, again, whether it's water, air pollution, facilities are predominantly self-policed for com compliance, whether it's um, Denver Water, whether it's Suncor, whether it's, and we'll, we'll go through a couple of facilities just to spotlight up ahead, but um, they are um, self-policed for compliance and they're really only kind of doing the bare minimum really of uh, monitoring for what is actually regulated. Uh, many legal limits um, just have not been updated for decades. That's another problem. And so getting a passing grade from the federal government does not mean that air and water meets the latest health guidelines or that limits are actually protective of human health. Um, nor do the a lot of limits that are set account for exposure to what we term chemical cocktails. So in North Denver, we know that there's many, many different sources of um, many, many different sources of um, of uh, pollutants in North Denver. Um, and so the limits that are set, while they might have been set kind of looking at the chemical uh, individually, uh, we really should be getting to a point where we're looking at the cumulative impacts that someone standing in North Denver community um, experiences and the total body burden of all these different chemicals rather than just f looking at limits um, at chemicals one by one. So. Um, and we're, we're never going to be able to do that without more robust data um, and monitoring to really know the full burden that, um, of exposure that people are experiencing in communities. 
Um, next slide. So this is, um, this is a map that was pulled from the uh, EPA's toxic release inventory. So it is a one of those kind of self-report, self-regulating systems where if you fall into a certain category of industry, you need to report um, kind of annual average emissions um, to, the, uh, to this database that you can kind of search. So I searched, I typed in 80216 and um, this is the map that came up for uh, facilities within two, 10 miles of 80216. And there's, there's 70 sources of toxic releases here. Um, and right now there's the tox TRI kind of covers, there's only about 767 different um, chemicals that if you're emitting one of those 767, you would be re reporting um, and ending up on this map. Uh, but again, largely relies on self-reporting. Sometimes people over-report because they don't want to get in trouble for being um, over, in, like for emitting over in the future. Um, and so it's not always accurate. Uh, so a lot of problems here with this. Yeah, definitely we'll get to the questions for sure. Um, next slide. So now just spotlighting, like zooming in on that map and going to look at just a couple of the facilities. Of course, here's the big one that we all know about. We know it well, Suncor Refinery. Um, it reported to our own Colorado um, Department of Public Health and Environment that um, it emits nearly a ton of benzene a year um, and over 12 tons of hydrogen sulfide annually. Um, and for a little bit of perspective, we were hoping to have facilities that emitted over a ton of benzene uh, simply with one of the pieces of legislation that we'll talk about later, um, uh, emitting over uh, a thousand pounds of benzene, so half of a ton of benzene, we wanted them to have regular real-time monitoring and we wanted facilities um, that were emitting 12 or 10,000 pounds um, so five tons of hydrogen sulfide to be monitoring. So the, the, this facility is like well over the thresholds for what we think is um, concerning. Um, and we know that there's been repeat hydrogen cyanide emissions, repeat hydrogen sulfide emissions, the catalyst, the opacity events. Um, anyone who kind of watches the news locally has seen emissions from Suncor. We also know that um, Suncor has also far exceeded the EPA health advisory of 70 parts per trillion for PFAS. So that's already a level that, as we talked about before, we um, figured is just too high. Um, and, you know, with the EPA's level of 70 parts per trillion being too high, just this January of 2020, Suncor reported that they emitted um, 199 parts per trillion of PFAS um, in that month. So we're talking about three, over three, you know, over three times the limit of what an acceptable level of PFAS is. And we're talking about um, levels of PFAS that are now going into the South Platte and into Sand Creek. Um, so, and you know, if you look at kind of the TRI, you can also kind of look at compliance history. And if anyone's interested in like where to find these resources online, I can, I'll, I'll drop my email in the chat after this presentation. But um, if you look at Suncor, you can see that they were out of compliance with the Clean Air Act for every quarter of the most recent three years. So 12 quarters of the last three years out of compliance. Um, every, every, um, quarter, which was uh, deemed a high priority violation, so like red zone, like worst type of violation. And they were also out of compliance with the Clean Water Act for 11 of the 12 quarters of the last three years, eight of which were significant category one um, Clean Water Act violations, which is also kind of the red zone, um, worst type of violation for the Clean Water Act. Um, and then, so now getting to a few, while the spotlight is often on Suncor, there's a few other facilities that are really big offenders. Um, and so just to like Suncor, for example, reported nearly a ton of benzene emissions. This asphalt plant here, Owens Corning Trumbull Asphalt, which is kind of just across the street from Suncor, um, reported uh, nearly two tons of benzene, so almost double the amount of Suncor um, that they reported in estimated annual emissions in tons uh, per year to our Colorado Department of um, Health and Environment, and uh, over a ton of hydrogen sulfide annually. And they were out of compliance with the Clean Water Act for every single quarter of the most recent three years, um, uh, with two of those quarters being significant category one um, non-compliance. And there's pictures of it. 
Um, next one uh, is the Central I-70 construction project. So Ian will probably touch on this a bit more because this is the uh, litigation he was involved with. But, um, you know, current, it's underway. We all know it. we're driving to the airport, driving around anywhere. It's a uh, uh, plan now to triple I-70s width. Um, and it's certainly going to increase air pollution and noise pollution for residents. Um, in 2018, there was legal action that um, uh, was brought and a set, would ended up in a settlement agreement, which um, called for a community health study uh, of cum cumulative impacts. So kind of what we're talking about, like getting to a better sense of that chemical cocktail and what people truly face in the community, um, rather than looking at individual pollutants, um, air monitoring for particulate uh, con construction dust, um, landscaping along the highway and community outreach. And that was a great result. Of course, this is still going to result in higher pollution in the neighborhood. So um, if anything, it's really, it's mitigating the effects of this um, project just um, somewhat. Next slide. North Denver pollution source, uh, also Purina, we all know it well. I used to live very close to this, smells like dead animals. Uh, it's a source of over um, 1,300 odor complaints between 04 and 2017. Uh, it was out of compliance with the Clean Water Act for every quarter of the most recent three years, so 12 quarters, um, with two of them being significant category one non-compliance. I will give Purina a shout out. They uh, have switched to some solar power, which is good, and they haven't had any um, air, um, air non-compliance recently again, by EPA standards. <laughs> Next one, Phillips 66 terminal. So there's a number of these kind of terminals up in the North Denver area. This is just one of them. They're really just above ground storage tanks where um, Phillips 66 stores their gasoline for it to be distributed out to all of their retail places. Um, so in these tanks, it's just a ton of gasoline and trucks roll up and kind of fill up before they go um, and kind of fill up each of the gas stations. Um, so remember Suncor with uh, just uh, near, uh, nearly a ton of benzene emissions per year that they reported to Colorado. We're talking about 26 tons of benzene um, estimated annually that they, they've reported that they have emitted um, and they've been out of compliance with the Clean Water Act for nine of 12 quarters of the most recent three years with eight quarters being significant slash category one um, worst type of Clean Water Act violations. Yes, the PowerPoint is um, and presentation is being recorded and I, I believe it's gonna be sent around. So that's, that's just highlighting a few of the facilities. At this point, I'm gonna be turning it over to Ian a bit more, but um, you know, the, the gist is that you know, there's a lot of facilities out there. Monitoring is extremely limited. Data is extremely important. Um, we need better monitoring. We need to better understand these chemical cocktails that people are facing um, so that we can understand um, and set limits and guidelines that are truly protective of human health. Well said, Becca. Um, thanks again for all that information. I think what you're seeing here is that there are a lot of businesses that are out of compliance, even with their own self-reporting. And so, you know, we as advocates have been pushing to draw more attention, to draw more regulation, and to get more data so that we can understand what's really happening here. And, you know, it's once we have that data that we can make data-informed decisions about where are the places that we can make quick fixes um, where we can make regulations and make changes that are going to improve the lives of the people in this community. I just wanted to start uh, to just take a moment to talk a little bit more about transportation, more than we can talk about here. <clears throat> you can see here that Commerce City, Globeville, Larry, Swansea are literally ringed by uh, interstates, uh, 220, or I-25, I-70, and 270. You know, the, the case that I was involved with that uh, Becca is alluding to has to do with the Central 70 widening. And beyond the fact that it's going to increase the amount of pollution in this community and the small particulate matters in particular, these very small ones that cross the blood brain barrier and cause all these problems is also being dug through Superfund sites. And I'm going to be talking about Superfund sites here in a little, but the most important thing you need to know is that it is the most, the highest level of danger for um, metals or other pollutants that are in the soil. Well, when they're digging up and deciding to bury this highway, they're digging what they, what I heard at the time was the equivalent of three, if you took three uh, mile high stadiums and you filled it full of dirt, that is literally how much dirt they're pulling out of here. 
this dirt is contaminated. There are deep concerns about whether that small dust will now be put into the air and impact the people in these communities. The other thing that I think is important to notice and we're gonna talk about is that we're building these things next to rivers. Well, there's natural hydrology under the ground. And so the water is moving through these soils. We disrupt these soils, the water moves through and it picks it up. There's a lot of concerns about um, putting these heavy metals um, putting these pollutants straight into the Platte River and we're sending it upstream to where we grow our food. You know, the other thing I would say is the medium and heavyweight trucks. So you can imagine just the sheer volume of industry that exists in this community. There are countless, countless, countless diesel trucks that are turning on every single morning. So when those turn on, they are also kicking out these volatile organic compounds that turn into ozone. They're also kicking out these small particles of dust that you inhale. So when we talk about climate justice, when we talk about electrifying our transportation system, if we can move into programs that are gonna move us on these medium and heavyweight trucks faster, it will have a huge impact on the people who live in this community. I also wanna say that 270 is now under discussion for widening. So that's right, we got I-70 and 270 widened, which is going to induce more demand and drive more vehicles onto the road. And south of this area on I-25, they're also talking about widening and realigning these roads to the tune of billions. You know, we've already spent $2 billion to widen this one and a half miles of two miles of highway here through Global Area Sponsia. And it just seems to me as RTD is going through its austerity, and as our plans from CDOT call for us to make these transitions, that we should not be widening highways through Latino communities, but instead we should be really investing in electric bus buses to give people more access here. The other thing is, and we didn't have time to touch on this in the slides here today, but I grew up right next to a Union Pacific uh, interchange. You can see it here, it says UP Denver. But all throughout this entire area, we also have these train interchanges. Many of these trains that are coming through here, um, W. Ortega, Councilwoman from Denver, has been working for years to talk about train safety from explosions, from emergency plans. That's one thing that, you know, when you come to all these dangerous facilities, do we have a strong emergency plan for the people who work or live in this general area? Do we have a warning system that is going to inform them of the things that are happening to them so they can best take care of themselves? You know, these train interchanges are massive and they back up and bring in massive amounts of coal that are brought straight through our community. And these coal trains, they actually can't uh, be covered because the gas builds up and they become explosive. So they travel in these open pits where all that small dust is ending up in the lungs of our children and of the people whom we're living in these communities. So um, I wanna talk to you about Heron Pond and I might go back a slide here. Um, Heron Pond is located inside Denver, really close to the Adams County border, and it is a very shallow pond that is full of cadmium and arsenic and lead. And there has been a movement afoot for the last few years to really try to fund the rep reparations of this area, to repair it, to repair the ecology, to dredge out these uh, chemicals and dispose of them properly. I am happy to announce that in the 2021 budget, for Denver Parks and Recreation, you will see that $6.2 million has been dedicated to this cleanup. And I'm not certain if that's enough to do it, um, but I want you to know that, you know, there are examples that of our work coming together to repair some of these um, spaces. Um, oh, here it is right here. So you'll see here, um, th also this GCC of America is a, con a concrete facility and you'll see Trumbull asphalt there adjacent to it. So this is the pond um, that is full of those heavy metals. Um, we talked a little bit about the flow um, of forever chemicals from Suncor. I just wanted to say that thanks to the support of people in the community, thanks to people like Becca and our other colleagues, we've been able to really elevate this conversation, Colorado Public Radio here covering it. And really as, you know, as Becca said, getting to a place where we have some standards. Now, I would agree with Becca that these are not good enough standards, that we have more to do, and that we need to begin thinking about things cumulatively. So I want to touch on a minute for what is a Superfund. A Superfund site are these contaminated sites that exist with hazardous waste being dumped, left out in the open, or managed improperly from these manufacturing and processing facilities, landfills, and mining sites. They're all over this country, they're all over the state of Colorado, but there are several 
in this region and several that have been cleaned up or remediated to the environmental standards for the federal government and development is now on them. But I'm including them in this presentation because I think it's important for you to know that they were there. That that legacy of what is underneath the ground, we shouldn't lose that common knowledge. We shouldn't lose this information that these are all part of a larger problem our community is facing. So this Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, also known as CERCLA, we call it CERCLA, uh, was passed in 1980. And what it does is it allows the EPA or contractors or states to come into work to make sure that these areas are cleaned up. So what are the, what are the goals of Superfund and why would we Superfund them? To protect human health and the environment by cleaning up these contaminated sites, to make the responsibilities parties pay for work cleanup. And I'll say that we run into problems with this in the past where the responsible parties don't actually have enough resources to be the ones that clean up the problem. And so we, the taxpayers, we, the people end up getting stuck with it. This is a conversation that we're having right now with fracking wells, right? Whether they're going to be abandoned and who's going to be able to pick up the stock to make sure that they're safe for the other people. Now, this says that we're supposed to be involved in the Superfund process. Now, we have a citizens advisory group for the I-70 Vasquez um, Superfund site. And I know that I believe I heard Bridget and others who participate this on this call. We continue as communities to run into problems with engaging with our elected leaders, with engaging with the correct departments, it's this game that seems to be played where you're not talking to the right person. Oh, well, that's somebody else's responsibility. And what I've learned in my environmental justice work is to be wary of politicians whom use jurisdiction as a problem and to be aware that corporations are experts, precision surgeons at exploiting systems of jurisdiction, right? Many of these problems that we're facing here are on the border of two counties on the border of two congressional districts. And so it's because of these county issues that they're able to pass the hot potato back and forth. And we have a, as a community have struggled to really improve the lives of the people in our community. So I alluded here to the I-70 Superfund sites, several of them here. Um, you can see the highway is running directly through this. And as I was telling you, the digging of this dangerous soil, several of these areas have had their soil tested and cleaned myself, my, my mother's home, had their soil remediated. Um, in this super fun site, you'll see several uh, operating units. And what we're gonna do is when I send this out, I'm gonna send you information about the citizens advisory group. So that if you're really interested in this specific super fund, the exact chemicals that are in the ground here, what they're doing to try to get the community voice to the front of the table, we I'm sure they would love to have you join in. Now, these are two that are in Commerce City that are no longer in operations, that have been delisted from the Superfund site, that there are now businesses and other things that are operating on top of them. This Woodbury Chemical Co Corporation, they had issues with chemicals and wood that break down into something called creosote. Creosote is another toxic chemical that can move through the water. And then you have the Sand Creek Industrial Park. You know, they look at the Sand Creek Industrial Park as an example of success. I, I was reading on here that they say there's like, there's hundreds and hundreds of businesses that are now on top of this area. Again, I just think it's very important for people to understand that this is there. You know, my mother works for Commerce City um, in the housing department and they're moving her new office on, onto this office industrial park. And so and these issues and being aware that this is here is super important. Um, you heard uh, Lucy allude to earlier about the Rocky Mountain Arsenal. And the Rocky Mountain Arsenal was in operation for 42 years where they made chemicals. Mustard gas, napalm, white phosphorus, lucite, chlorine gas, sarin gas. And then it was leased to public uh, private entities to create pesticides and herbicides. It is uh, one of the highest level uh, super fun sites and just the, the concern I believe in the soil that's underneath there. It is opened um, as a refuge, it is capped and it isn't meant for us um, to leave be. But you'll see here, as Lucy was alluding to, that the Adams City High School sits on this contaminated land. Um, just a few blocks south of here is the Commerce City City and County Building. Also sits on this land where my mother works now. Um, there are a lot of people here who don't talk about drinking the water, 
right? The concerns about seepage. You know, um, until your water's been tested, you know, you don't know if it's safe or not. And here in Commerce City, what we hear all the time is that people are just really wary of it. Um, this is also the Arsarco globe plant. This was a, a mineral uh, smelter plant and um, it also has been delisted, but you can see its adjacency to the Heron Pond. And when you're talking about heavy metals that are in the water and you see that just a couple blocks away is the location of this site. You know, this comes again back to that conversation I was having with you about how the water moves underground and picks up these and makes their way to the river. So, you know, you've heard a lot about what's happening and what is out there. And Becca and I wanted to take a moment to talk about some of the legislation that's happening, that has happened, what's on the table now, where we're going, so you can be part of the solutions going forward. Yeah, so just uh, quick, quickly touching on a couple of um, legis uh, legislative bills last year that, of course, with um, COVID happening, ended up uh, slightly different at the end of the session than uh, we intended at the start. But the first one being uh, House Bill 1143, which was um, had a goal of increasing environmental uh, fines, civil penalties, essentially, for polluters who violate um, the Clean Air and Clean Water uh, Acts. Um, and so that was successful in raising the penalties. Uh, they were really just uh, around the 10000 and $15,000 dollar area per day, um, which for facilities like Suncor, that's just a drop in the bucket of the budget, uh, very easy to pay for violation. Uh, and the federal level had um, soared over time to up to closer to 55,000 a day. And so we did change the penalty, successfully change the penalties to match the EPA and it will continue to increase with inflation. But the unfortunate uh, loss on that bill was that we hoped that that civil penalty money would be put into a fund um, with a board to uh, kind of help run the fund. Uh, and so that that um, with community representatives on the board, so that money could go um, back to community for environmental mitigation projects. Uh, that portion of the bill, unfortunately, did not move forward. Um, and that's something that we hoped will be back on the table again in the future. The other piece of legislation was House Bill 1265. Uh, which really was kind of uh, what we're talk what we're talk what I was talking about is a big missing piece in all of this is like data, good data. Um, we know that monitoring is very limited, and so this bill would have required um, certain facilities that fell over certain thresholds of emissions to have real time monitoring for a set of certain toxins uh, known to be kind of the most dangerous ones um, and most prevalent ones in Colorado. Um, and that one, and part, as part of that, the, it would have triggered a kind of uh, real-time notifications to community members when limits of those toxins are exceeded. The portion of the bill that did end up passing was um, community, community notific notification when allowable limits are exceeded, but because we don't have that real-time monitoring um, in place, uh, which we hope to get in the future. Uh, it's really like if they are violating their permit or, um, and there's some continuous monitoring for opacity and particulate matter, um, but it's, you know, it's not, it's not as robust as we wanted it to be, but there is a community notification um, system that's coming into place. And I think many, uh, several of the panelists have been involved with getting this up and running. I've been on maternity leave, but um, so I'm not fully up to speed on that, but um, yes, but, but the big missing piece of this legislation is that we, we didn't get in place this, this real-time monitoring, which would give us fundamental data to better understand um, exposure to um, pollutants in our communities to start really um, taking a second look at what um, limits are in our communities, um, kind of from that chemical cocktail effect and that, and because we really wanted to have a, um, a rulemaking to really start looking at cumulative impacts of pollution rather than just kind of setting limits of each individual individual toxins. So that's definitely something that um, we are hoping to see come back in the legislature um, next year. <laughs> Thanks, Becca. Yeah. So the next slide, I'm going to touch on the EJ for All Act, but I also just want to talk about some rules that are already in existence that have been under attack by the Trump administration and the EPA. The rollback of the clean car standards, which would advance the kind of motors and the kind of small particulate matters that are going to end up in the air. 
Now that's, this is about building towards the future by requiring cleaner cars, because that is going to improve the amount of air pollution that is in a community that is concentrated with so many vehicles. Methane, the methane rollback of these rules that help advance um, methane capture um, from oil and gas operations. You know, we have strong methane regulations here. We still have leaks and issues. We still have flaring and issues that are taking place. Um, both uh, on site for gas drilling welling and also at Suncor. And this comes to the chemical disaster rule. The chemical disaster rule is actually how I found my way to Green Latinos. It was uh, being out there brought by Earth Justice to Washington, DC to fight for third party analysis, to require the advancing um, of technology when old technology is found to be faulty and at the heart of the issue that caused a problem releasing toxics into a community. I do want to say that it's taken us a long time, but we have gotten commitments from Representative Jason Crow, Representative Diana Gett, and Representative Perlmutter to have town halls, environmental justice based town halls, where members of the community can take the information that we provided you here today and in other webinars and tell them yourself that these problems that have gotten worse under this leadership have to change that we can't just look at the scores that we have um, and rankings from national green orgs when we know that the boxes that our people are checking are at the healthcare clinic. We know that we have so much more to do and it's only through our collective action that we have been able to get these commitments, that we've been able to move this far. I know that in late November, early December is when we're aiming at to have these conversations. I think it's gonna be crucial um, for all of you to show up to bring all your information to the table and to really ask things of our representatives about how did this zip code become one of the most polluted zip codes in the United States and what plan of action do you have? Regardless if you sit on the committee that has the most authority over this issue, you need to be an environmental justice expert. You need to be a climate justice expert. This bill, the Environmental Justice for All Act is out right now. And I can tell you that Diana DeGette has signed on to it and Jonah Goose from Boulder. Even though we have all these environmental justice issues happening in Commerce City, Perlmutter has not signed on to this act yet. But what it does is it amends and it strengthens the Civil Rights Act of 1964 so that you personally can go after polluters for the pollution that they're putting on you, for the toxics that are happening to you. It requires the consideration of cumulative impacts so again, we're talking about how do these things add up? You know, nine legal um, chemicals that are at 90% threshold are going to have some sort of combined effect. There's no doubt. It codifies the Clinton administration's executive order for environmental justice, the basis of a majority of the environmental justice um, rules and regulations that we have here in the United States. It's gonna reinforce the National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA which also has been under attack by the Trump administration. But why is it important? Because it means that when there are federal funding going into these projects that are going to impact you, you have a voice. It does not guarantee a win. You know, we use NEPA, we sued under NEPA for I-70 and we weren't successful. But if we even take those tools away, it becomes even more unattainable for us to fight the kind of projects that will cause our communities harm. You know, this is, asserts health equity and it intends to fund programs to better study the harmful impacts um, of cosmetics and other um, products that are marketed towards women, in particular women of color. It provides outdoor access for all, right? We know that during this pandemic, it has been nearly impossible for these people in this community to get the respite, to truly go outside and to be able to rest and walk in clean air. We're going to fight for more access, whether it be park space inside your community or access to the mountain parks. And then lastly, it establishes these EJ grant programs and ensures fair and just transition. It's going to fund programs that help us turn the, turn the page on this reckless fossil fuel pollution and not leaving behind the people whom are working to feed their family. And it's also important because it's going to put monies into groups like ours so that we can take on these NEPA fights, so that we can take on the things that are happening to us. So I invite you, you know, to pressure your representatives to sign on to this. This is something that is very important. Actually, um, Vice President nominee Kamala Harris is the co-sponsor of this in the Senate. And with that, I wanna close by welcoming 
our great friend and a spiritual leader here for us, Renee Chacon. Ian, before we close, there are um, a few questions in the chat. Could we just maybe do two or three and then turn it over to Renee? I, there were some really good ones that I thought. Yeah, absolutely. Which ones did you call them out? Okay, cool. Um, let's see. I did answer the ones that popped up in the Q&A. I answered the ones that I had good you know, answers to um, about... I, I don't know about the clean fleet timeline. That's the one that's unanswered, but the other ones, I did the type of response. <laughs> um, in the chat, someone's asking about real time monitoring and could that be legislated at the state level? Could this pass in Colorado Congress rather than the federal government? Yeah, um, and it was something that we were trying to get passed. Um, this, it didn't really work this year, just, um, because of the coronavirus, our budget was drastically um, cut. You know, we saw over a, a billion dollars kind of cut off, lopped off our budget um, due to coronavirus relief. Um, and so setting up uh, real-time monitoring, CDPHE took that as kind of requiring a rulemaking to kind of set up guidelines for what that would need to look like. And that rulemaking would cost money and resources. So it was not ultimately something that they thought that they could take up this year. Um, we think we can make the case that if they can just at least spend some on the rulemaking, we can make the facilities pay for their own to, you know, to self-monitor and to make that, um, you know, transparent. Because at one point, CDPHG was concerned about um, putting, you know, what it would cost to build a website, to put all this information up. But, you know, we've really tried to make the case that, you know, you need to be charged, facilities should be the one to charge for placing a monitor at their fence line and for building the website um, to house the data. And so that's something that we're gonna continue to push is that sure, um, maybe CDPG needs to, to invest a little bit just to get the, the guidelines in place for what monitoring should look like um, and to work with communities to develop plans for what monitoring in the community is gonna look like. But um, the cost of actual monitoring and ma maintaining monitors should fall in facilities. And that's, that's the argument we're gonna make this year. Looter should one pay. Looter should pay. Yeah. I think yes. that needs to be our mantra when it comes to all of this. The yes. polluters are the ones that are profiting. Our people are the ones who are paying. And, and to... I saw a, a question from Nikki Roy as well about um, kind of a protocol for assessing cumulative impacts of most multiple sources of pollution. That was really something, that was another rulemaking that we, we really tried to go after with 1265 last year. And there are good examples of that from other states. For example, California um, has kind of uh, undertaken some some uh, health impacts studies that where, where they've really been able to set uh, health-based limits that are recognizing kind of the chemical cocktail rather than just an individual pollutant. And so we have examples that we can turn to from other states. Again, it was just a question of um, resources in this dire fiscal climate year um, and a rulemaking and CPG felt like they were a bit um, underwater with um, doing something new uh, in, in this time. So that's and on that point, um, we've seen uh, just a recent success in New Jersey with environmental justice advocates passing cumulative impact legislation. Would mm -hmm. that kind of um, legislation be something that you all would be interested in seeing happening in Colorado? Absolutely. So, yeah, New Jersey kind of passed a um, new piece of legislation that requires that any time a permit is renewed, um, there's a bit broader, much broader kind of a community impact assessment that looks at health as, you know, human health as one factor in that really broad um, assessment. And we've talked about that as a coalition and kind of looked at the bell. Um, and I, I think plans are still formulating uh, about exactly what's going to be put forth and what sponsors are interested in bringing. Um, but yes, that that New Jersey legislation is, is a great way to do it. It's, um, you know, but Suncor's permanent, unfortunately, like is kind of currently in the process of being renewed. Um, so I don't know if we would we would get anything in, in in time and they'd have a couple more years to keep doing it. But um, before they would hit another renewal point, but, um, you know, is going on now as well that, you know, anytime these permits are for re renewal, engage as com as community members, for sure, because um, that should be happening soon. Awesome. All right. Well, I, those are all the questions that I see. I want to turn it back over to Renee. So thank you for answering those. Oh, Mateo. Plazo, Mateo. 
My name is Renee Malachuko, and I'm Youth Program Coordinator at Spirit of the Sun, co-founder and cultural educator of Women from the Mountain. We often link, um, unfortunately, data having to do with human trafficking and human smuggling in and around extractive industries. And Suncor is very key to that, but that's been key since Columbus because a lot of our issues are found on a lot of predatory capitalism in and around on marginalized communities. That being said, I ask those within earshot to understand what it means to be a good ancestor with all this information that now you've obtained. Um, when I hear this information as a mother of two sons, as a teacher, as someone that also lives in Commerce City, is from these lands indigenously, and I hear the name Sand Creek, it adds insult to inter environmental violence injury because Sand Creek, if you know it, then Colorado is already a historical violence that often isn't educated within our American identity. So indigenous communities, there are still 48 tribes that travel within Colorado. There are still two reservations here and we are still here. And the epitome of environmental racism is indigenous communities that often hold these spaces morally more sacred than you, not being able to have our living rights and our rights to nature at all defended or protected while we are also marginalized. So I ask you to be a good ancestor in truly what that means. And that means in looking at corporations as not these faceless entities and as not, if they're gonna claim personhood as people that should be held as moral people. These are facilities that are operated and founded on people very capable of knowing what moral should be and hold criminal negligence and intentions for profit accountable. We have been choking and killing ourselves and indigenous and people of color communities in Colorado directly that we have been flushed out. And we can prove this socioeconomically in Colorado since it's been a state and before that. So we really need to keep in mind how far reaching these are for our future generations. That's why I ask you to be a good ancestor now is because you are living within this historical time. The EPA, we keep claiming EPA, but again, that has been rolled back this year heavily under this administration and we're about to hit an election. So we have to realize that that is in every ability to be active in our own information and it should not have taken 10 years for us to get to this level in Colorado. And we should be ashamed of that, Ferruenzos. Um, fence line communities also refer to sacrifice zones. That's what they are and we do have to change and dismantle our terminology. These are sacrifice zones. And I'm going to straight call out a lot of these places as no longer faceless because Mark Little is CEO of Suncor. Look him up, email him, say how you doing. Um, Gold King Mine, Copper Mine um, has been known already to completely annihilated our water in Colorado and has all the way down to Arizona, specifically indigenous communities. That guy's named Todd Hennis. And a lot of these people, again, are not held at any type of criminal negligence for the rights to life and our natural resources for the rights of nature. So what I'm asking really is no longer look at these spaces as resources, but as sources of life. If they give life-giving, we should now have some form of protection and legality to catch up with that of our American identity of realizing that BIPOC communities are being impacted by not having these rights. We also need to realize that environmental violence is, is systemic and it also needs to be changed. We need to realize that our communities are being impacted for already three generations ago. <laughs> so that's why we unfortunately still have situations like Lucy's family. I myself also suffer from anemia. I grew up in and around Denver. My son now suffers from nosebleeds. And I frankly don't know anybody in Colorado that has not had some sort of respiratory issue. I don't care how healthy you are during this year of COVID because of wildfires. So if indigenous and BIPOC communities have had to have moral panic in the past, now we all have to. So I suggest we look at um, Polis's new roadmap and realize where it is not adequate and what's missing in it. Um, key things we need to analyze if we're going to really be critical as citizens is equity analysis. 
We need to be able to know what it means to reduce harmful co-pollutants, not just um, GHG emissions. Ensure beneficial technology and innovations are accessible to all communities of color. That should have been held by the law of HB 1912-61, which was supposed to protect disproportionately impacted communities such as BIPOC communities. We should also enforce policy recommendations, backstop fines or enforce some sort of consequences that is going to stop polluters from killing people and the environment. We need to legitimately have fines that are going to stop polluters, but redistribute wealth. This means fixed disparities by funding healthcare costs and living costs affected by those living in sacrifice zones and from polluters consistently violating with no real consequences. We need something they can feel. We need to again all re realize that these are corporations, not people, so they should no longer be held faceless and corporations, if they're gonna do their own independent monitoring, should also realize when there's criminal negligence and flush those people out of their corporations that are harming people over profit. And then lastly, I truly want to those to remember that rights of nature are life giving. Don't get in the way of survival. These are for our future generations. And we need to realize when profits are getting in the way of our future generation survival and literally our survival right now during climate change. These are talks we should have had 10 years ago. And we all know that these are talks we should have had a hundred years ago. And we now have the chance to dismantle, to disenfranchise those that have harmed us and truly protect ourselves in a real um, legal way in a time that all of us truly feel that life-giving energy. I don't know anybody that isn't, that truly realizes that this is the time and the time is now because it's for survival. So I don't care what path you might've feel shamed on before, to have brought you here. If you feel like a polluter yourself when you are sometimes wasting those straws or not always recycling, now is your chance to not feel shame anymore, but realize you have the moral responsibility to be a life giver for yourself and those around you and you can't that environment. I thank you all. I humbly am honored and I truly, hope that as a teacher, as a mother, mother, as an educator of cultural resiliency, we start involving those that have been harmed the most as leaders, no longer just at the table, but can create their own table because they survivor, survived every form of genocide, including environmental genocide. So I thank you for today. Thank you, Ian, as always. Thank you, Shana. Thank you, Lucy. Mwah. Thank you, Becca. Thank you, Karen. And thank you, all those listening. Hooray. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. I think the last thing I want to say is that everyone needs to realize that we're not just sitting here and taking our trauma, that we are organized, we are educated, and we are fighting back. And we welcome you to the front lines of climate justice with us. Thank you. Thank you.